Good evening. I'd like to bring this meeting to order. A committee of the Whole for West Jordan City Council, June 1st, 2022. We have Council Member Jacob, Council Member Green, Council Member Whitelock, and Council Member Bloom, and several members of staff. He said Whitelock. I am white lot. Oh my gosh. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was thinking Melissa for some reason. Um, I think I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Wow. Yeah. Two W's makes it hard. Anyway, I'll call this to order. And our first item of business is the proposed plan and ordinances for the Southwest Quadrant. I believe we have Mr. Gardner. He presented us with a uh, paper. And I keep turning that on and off. So, Alan, can you thank you for the time? Um, I know you've got a lot to do tonight, so I won't uh, take a lot of your time. Uh, the city, in uh, conjunction with economic development, which is part of the city but with the Gardner Company, have been uh, working on a plan that we have. Um, because we're not very creative. We call it the Southwest Quadrant. And so, but I think that's to kind of mirror the Northwest Quadrant in Salt Lake City. And so that is uh, basically what it says. It's in the Southwest Quadrant of the city. You can see on this slide, <clears throat> you can see the big Amazon and big Boeing building, um, you know, kind of along Old Bingham Highway. Uh, the area that we will be discussing is the area that was, uh, you know, is dashed around. And so the objectives of this master planning effort is to uh, responsibly plan the, re the remaining acreage, you know, which is several hundred acres. It's uh, the majority of it's owned by the, the Merlin Jones family. Um, uh, there's another Lamar Jones family that owns other uh, hundreds of acres out there, but we're talking mostly about this uh, property tonight. <clears throat> and representatives from the Gardner Company, uh, Mike Jones uh, from the Jones families here, as well as Newtown uh, Development. Uh, and so one of the other objectives is to create a distinct sub-market for high tech high-tech manufacturing and to bring economic development to West Jordan. A lot of these uh, businesses and jobs and buildings that Mr. Pangra and his staff are getting are very large. Uh, they generate a significant amount of tax revenue for the city and provide a lot of uh, needed good paying jobs to that area. And so the, that's been one of the primary objectives of this area of the city for a few years now is to uh, make it a job center uh, where people can in our community can work or come from outside of our uh, <clears throat> community work and so this gives the option for those high tech paying jobs or higher paying jobs than just uh, fast food or convenience stores uh, it creates a cohesive master plan with an open space and trail network and one of the things that we want to accomplish in this is to efficiently buffer existing residential neighborhoods and uh, from the commercial and industrial users so that these uh, businesses that come in here will feel uh, comfortable and confident being close to residential. And I'll show you later in a slide the type of residential uh, that is being proposed, find solutions to the infrastructure constraints. So if you can go, Alan, once. And so this is uh, not the area that we are talking about tonight. It's the entire area. You can see the areas in purple is owned by the Vicki Jones family. Uh, kind of the yellow colors, Amazon. There's a pink uh, color right in the, the the uh, center of Mike Jones property, and that's owned by uh, McDougal and Olson family. But what we're talking about primarily tonight is the green and the yellow. Um, so go ahead, Alan. And the infrastructure, so water is either provided by uh, zone six, is in zone five or zone six. So area, all the areas we're talking about tonight are 
will be serviced by tanks that are either are under construction or getting closer to being under construction. Uh, I know zone six is, uh, uh, should be under construction now or it's the site's being prepared in zone five. Uh, Corbin can probably fill you in on the agreement how that's coming for the zone five water tank. Um, okay, keep going. Okay, so the infrastructure, Barney's Wash, it runs from the Ochre Mountains through uh, the Vicki Jones property at about, you know, kind of parallels New Bingham Highway, and it runs right through, or right at the last third or quarter of the Mike Jones property that would be just um, north of Echo Ridge and north of the, the Amazon. Um, property. And so the Gardner Company is looking to do creative ways to make that wash uh, still work as a drainage component, a trail component, and allow uh, the property to be used to its highest and best value for industrial and commercial development. As you can see, <coughs> the current general plan for the whole area has about 950 acres, uh, 464 acres, or about 48% of that is commercial. Uh, with the Southwest Quadrant, and this is not including the McDougal piece I showed you, the acres would be just about 600 acres, and 511 acres of that will be commercial. So there's about 85 acres only of this buffer residential um, that I'll be talking about. And so that's one of the primary goals of this plan is to preserve as much commercial industrial office space uh, as possible for the benefit of the city, you know, to, for this job center and tax revenue generation. Ding, there we go. Okay. I come from the old film straight days. Can you go back one more, Alan? As you can see, there, there's several big parcels here. The green, again, is the Jones family, White, McDougall. So that's the area we're, we're talking about for the commercial. As you can see, uh, right on the very far right, kind of right next to Old Bingham Highway, it says existing residential. Now uh, that's Echo Ridge, and I can't remember the name of the apartment complex. Wilshire Place. You said it, I didn't know. And so, so what, what we've struggled with is how do you effectively buffer uh, commercial industrial users from existing residential? Um, the people in Echo Ridge, you know, they, they are, they call the mayor, they call community development a lot because of the truck traffic on their road, the issues with that. And so we wanted to make sure that that wasn't repeated. And so what what would be, what the solution is, is to propose a park between Echo Ridge and a for rent residential product between that and the industrial. Um, the the for rent, you know, has a couple of advantages using as buffer residential. A, it generates a lot more tax revenue for the city because things are, uh, uh, you know, valued at 100% of their valuation and taxed at 100% of their valuation. And B, it's a for rent product. And so if somebody doesn't like the neighborhood, uh, they can move it much easier. I'm not saying that people uh, for sale can't, but it also gives um, commercial developers um, a lot more comfort because uh, for that very reason. I'm not saying that they're going to be bad neighbors. But someone who buys a home, a lot of times they will stay there forever and maybe have the same complaints forever, you know, about truck traffic getting to the industrial properties. You can see the other buffer residential is up along um, 90 South, which is yet, the road is yet to be constructed. And so that would be another for rent residential product that would buffer largely <clears throat> the future junior high that is would be south of uh, Antelope Ridge Elementary, as well as Jones Ranch, and then the existing residential uh, to the east there. Okay, go ahead, Alan. 
And so there's a wide range of commercial types that uh, could be anticipated in the Southwest Quadrant, you know, for mixed use, probably at the, the more higher intense commercial node of 90 South and U111 office, probably anywhere in the product that's in the project that's close to to residential or on the exterior retail and of course industrial uh, would be uh, probably the primary draw of this type of development. Okay, go ahead. And you can see there's just some examples of, of buildings that are being anticipated, the industrial, um, you know, a lot of the industrial that's being anticipated out there is becoming very large buildings. Uh, Boyer just had their 1 million square foot uh, building approved, you know, which is exactly the same size as Amazon. Um, you know, Scott, what did you say? How many super Walmarts? Is that seven? Seven super Walmarts in one building. So um, the buildings just seem to be getting bigger. So one of the, one of the, the, the things in the ordinance, I won't talk a lot about the ordinance tonight, but it um, anticipates a cohesive design, <clears throat> you know, only not only of infrastructure, you know, we're following all the master plans, uh, but also a co cohesive development pattern. And through the ordinance, everything that is zoned Southwest Quadrant will come before the council and be approved by a master development plan and master development agreement, which will have design guidelines, landscaping guidelines and that type of thing. So the council can uh, be assured that what they're getting is, is what they anticipate. So Cindy, you're gonna have to play Alan for me there. <laughs> so, and then flex office is another keep going. That's fine. And then retail and makerspace and Ben Seastron will have to tell me what makerspace is because I've never quite understood that concept. I guess it's done a lot in Heber County, right? Weber County right now is a kind of a live work type. Ben, if I remember right, we talked about the building in the upper right hand corner. That's in Draper. Yeah, that's probably Draper. That's the one at 123rd and or 124th Street and 10th East. So if anybody wants to see that kind of a building, just drive to Draper at Fort Street and 10th East. And you, you might ask, well, well, why does this fit in the Southwest Quadrant? Because, you know, such large parcels and such large buildings, there's always going to be some little leftover remnant pieces like we have, for example, down by the Kmart on 90th South. These are the type of uses that would be programmed for those leftover spaces that don't seem to where big box retail or big box commercial or warehouse uh, don't seem to make use of. So go ahead. And then one more. And so this, this is kind of a layout of the uh, anticipated buffer housing. Uh, you can see that it will be a lot of uh, uh, apartment buildings, you know, the closer you get to residential, it'll be a townhome product. And then of course, on the uh, south side of 90th will be a townhome product also. And so I think it relates very well to the streets and the larger, larger buildings will be back in the site and they'll be surrounded by uh, townhomes. Up as you get closer to 90th South will be uh, more commercial office type uses. And then down, of course, we talked about close to Echo Ridge will be between Echo Ridge will be a park and then uh, a for rent residential product. Uh, the the Newtown Homes has done a very, is that what I'm saying that right? Newtown, Newtown Development has done a good job in screening the parking in the interior uh, of um, their, their product. Uh, rather than having the parking lots out on the street, because I think it'll relate well to the street. You can see Barney's Wash uh, flowing through the middle of this will be a trail system and and uh, those type of recreation amenities that the, not only the existing residents of the city can use, but also the new residents of the city. Okay, go ahead. And this is just another site diagram. You can see, go ahead. And you can see this is a this is a um, 
what it would look like in the street. And so they're from the industrial property. So I think it relates very well to the industrial. Go ahead, one more. Then this is a view from 90 South and the road, I think 6400 West. You can see town home products. I think it relates very well um, to the street. As I said, the ordinance, I talked about really high level of the ordinance. The uh, uses are fairly flexible. There's a lot of uses that can go into uh, the Southwest Quadrant, but the control for the council will be at the entitlement with the, uh, the MDA and the MDP. That's where you'll control the density of the residential. Um, and so this development, I believe, gives the city a lot more commercial industrial uh, job center product that we've been striving for out in the Southwest Quadrant and uh, limits the, the residential to just a buffer type product, we'll also, which will also serve as a workforce housing uh, product for people working and living out there. Uh, do you have any questions for me? I see none. Okay. Oh, maybe we do. I don't have a lot of questions, but can I interest you in a snarky comment or two? Never sure. I, I, I've got lots of snarky comments, but um, no, for the most part, this is this is all right. Um, a lot of the buildings are bigger than I'd like, and there's a lot of parking lots, which I think we probably- If you have a lot of workers, you need a lot of parking right, lots. Right, we're gonna have high paying jobs with, with low income housing, or not necessarily low income housing, but apartments. I mean. So workforce housing, the people that work here or that live here aren't going to be the ones that work here. It's, it's, I know it's the, it's the pitch and we get the pitch. But. Well, the beautiful thing about West Jordan is there is a wide array of housing options in this community. When, when they came to land use, it, the, the goal was to protect the existing homeowners. So that's why you have that housing the way it is. And I personally think they did a nice job in in how they laid it out. So that that was the point went from land use. That was our feedback to them. And no, that's I, why you're seeing it. I do get that. I still don't think the existing homeowners are going to like it. They say, we did this for you. Have some apartments. No we're matter what we care. do, they're not going <laughs> to like it. it we're not, we're not going to put single family residential in our commercial area. So right. sad well, somebody well, put again, single family I, homes in I our like commercial that. area. I like the phase one better than I like the phase two through six, but the, um, anyway, just my thoughts. Just as, as, just so you know, from the first time we, we've seen this three times now, have this is actually four for, this is actually the fourth time I've seen this. Um, the first that, that when, when they first gave us a proposal, it was a little bit nebulous. And, and, and Zach, we, we were very, the, the, the land use committee was very clear that the density in this buffer area wasn't going to be 60 units an acre. We made that clear. The density, the density of this is about now 22, 23 units an acre, if I remember right. I think overall for all the whole 85 acres. So there'll be areas that are more dense and areas that are less dense, yes. But overall the density, the, that, that density, given the nature of the apartments and those kind of things, um, I think it's a good buffer plan. Um, that The phase six is mixed use, isn't it? Yeah, so the phase six is mixed use. Um, the nice thing about phase two, three, four, and five is that you do have those short buildings on the front and they get taller towards the back. So it, it, it won't be as obvious. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty good with this layout actually. The other, the other thing, since Mike's sitting here, uh, I'll make mention. The other thing is that there is a lot of it. There is a lot of this land, if I recall right, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're actually going to retain ownership of that uh, and make to make sure that the development is yeah, to make sure that the development is done correctly. Um, and so we I, well, at least at least I appreciate that immensely. So thank you. So thank you for your time. This is enormously helpful to us as staff.
to get your feedback. So thank you. Any other comments from the council? All right, thank you. Next up, our budget. And tonight the plan is that we will just go through tabs. We'll start at the beginning. Um, are we gonna, where is she? Hiding back there behind the tall guys. <laughs> Ms. Steck, were we going to hear from you at all? No. Okay. All right. So Denise wants to be silent tonight. All right. So I will call out the tab. If you have anything in that, please let us know. Remember, this is open dialogue. Um, if you don't, then we'll move to the next one. So the first tab is introduction. Budget narratives. Organizational charts. Thank you, Denise and Corbin, for making my requested change. It, yeah, I was going to say that that requested change was with the handouts that we got last week, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's there. City Council. I want to stop there. Me too. Go first. Um, I would like to slash... Because I think I think it's just responsible to do this if we're talking about income or we're talking about property tax increases. Um, the from the professional in tech, I would like to drop some. The training, I would like to drop about eight hundred dollars. The the travel, the travel, that's the twelve three. I think that's designed to pay for seven people to all go to U ULCT. We haven't done that in the past. I'd like to drop that to 8K and I'd like to drop the department supplies um, back to, it. if you look at the history, we used 2056 one year, we used 1825. Instead of 2,500, I'm going to be picky and say, let's say $500. So I'd, I'd like to to see uh, at least those four numbers uh, drop. And then I had one question. Um, there's membership in the, on, the, on page 70. Um, we have the, uh, the membership in the Association of Municipal Clerks. That, I'm, I'm sure that's for Cindy, but the way, my, what I was wondering is with the Association of Min Municipal Clerks, it, do we also pay in that out of the recorder's budget or is that and or how much is the membership there and can we consolidate those or do something with that that would be my question on that one yes yeah do you have an answer <laughs> i know that the association is a per member charge so i know oh, okay. that one is for cindy and one is for tangy so okay that one would be fine but um i would need to know i how do we do like changes? Do we just do that three of you, four? There's four of us here. And as long as the four of us are in favor of it, then we can make the change is my opinion. So a four? Okay. Yeah, because that way we still have the majority, right? right. And that way I can say, but we all said so. Sorry, you didn't come. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, I have a question first on photos. We won't need the photos in City Hall because we won't have City Hall for this budget. So that makes sense. But um, do you want do you want to say anything, Mr. Anderson, with the proposed cuts? No, um, what you decide to do on the proposed cuts is fine. The, um, the, the what, you can always amend it if seven of you decide to go to ULCT. I know that hasn't happened traditionally, but typically how I budget it is uh, for everybody to go to the league. Um, so I've done that. I don't foresee anything that would be excessive uh, with the uh, supplies, department supplies. Um, as far as the photos, um, at, at this point, the my understanding is the remodel is 360 days from April, so I would imagine that this budget year we would be back in City Hall. Uh, uh, well, we always have our contingent funds if we need to have photos. 
Yeah, I do have. Uh, or there's Kinkos. Once, well, once we have, uh, once we have, uh, I've already got the photographer uh, volunteering uh, to take photos. Uh, when we get to the point where we can take a photo of the seven of you. Oh, so we won't need any money for photos. That's what he just said, right? I heard it. The photographer. <laughs> That, that for that price of a photographer though that's otherwise we're going to get school pictures <laughs> well i was thinking we could have uh marie with the camera and pamela adjust the settings and then marie can hit the button we, we, but have, we uh, need a lens to make us look nice the lens minimum is going to be closer to three years <laughs> i have a professional photographer yeah, who's okay donated. so we're okay yes. if we make those changes okay um Anyone have any other thoughts on Kelvin's suggestions? Are you okay with them? You okay? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So We're I need good. a repeat on what he wanted to do. Sorry. So professional in tech goes to 6K. Okay. The training goes to 9K. Travel goes to 8K. Department supplies goes to 2K. And my question on there is, are we good with our contingency amount? So, okay. Yeah, we're all good with that. Okay. All right. The next tab is the mayor's office. Didn't you have some on city council or did you get those in? I did. Okay. Yeah. Mine was contingency. Thanks. Um, so anyone have any on these besides me? On the mayor? Yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. I think it's all the same thing. Let's go with Pamela first. Um, the state of the state yeah, could you press your mic button, okay. please? Can yeah. you can you state the page number you're on though for us? 73. Thank you. And I think this is Kelvin's too, because we all have this marked. Um, the state of the city annual report 20K. Um, definitely want to reduce that. Uh, I don't know what do you guys think on the 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 the, the tab for that. that so okay. let me explain that one. That was one that I put in that budget. So the mayor doesn't even really realize it's in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he knows what it was. Um, what it was is the annual report that you asked for last year. So after the the annual audit is complete and we have final numbers, then we we will um, put together an annual report with financial information with year-end completion projects with um, any other information that we want in an annual report. Um, I use that terminology and maybe that was an incorrect terminology. I heard that it was more feeling like a, um, a mayor's address and that was not the intention. It was the annual report. It may get moved to my department if you want it to be in my department. It can move to the, the council office, but I know that it's something that a city as a whole is trying to really be or responsive to our residents. So this would probably be designed in December um, and numbers will be finalized and then probably released the first part of January. Where where it is a lot financial, I think your departments. Say it again, I'm sorry. Where what we're reporting is a lot of the finances mm -hmm. and what we did with the money. I think your department is the appropriate place for it. I'd be happy to put it there and just say resident annual report and we'll just move the funds into administrative services. Thoughts. Honestly, we haven't sent one out for two years. Why now? Um, let's say the we're going into an era, we're going into a situation where we're talking about increasing taxes. Uh, honestly, and, and I, I I'll just say this now, I think that the push for the city ought to be to stop mailing. The push needs to be I we disagree, need, uh, and but uh, we need to stop mailing. We need to start figuring out. And there may be a few people that need some mail, um, but we've got to start figuring out how to distribute uh, more of these reports electronically through whatever means that we can do. But uh, I mean, we see we we, we yeah. Uh, I, I'll I'll stay away from that one. Uh, I just. I, I, I'm okay with eliminating this completely. I'd be curious as to how much of it is the comp compilation and the 
and the production of the report versus the mailing of the report. I mean, mm -hmm. well, the mailing it would, would be a minimum of eleven to thirteen thousand plus. Right. Yeah. yeah, I was so, gonna say. So this isn't any this is no compilation costs. We'll do that on existing staff time out of my department. This is strictly the printing and mailing printing, costs yeah. for this piece. And this is pretty tight. That's pretty it's, conservative for yeah, you know. and this is tight. This is us getting really good bids and getting the mail out on this. So we can't, if we want to produce it, we can't reduce it. <laughs> um, but I am also a big fan of, of electronic communication and um, council member Green, I want you to know that that is definitely something we're looking at and we're moving forward to as we can. Uh, I think it's always good to have a transitionary period. Um, yeah, it's not going to happen all at once. So. <laughs> so, but but in terms of cost, this is probably the bare minimum on a on a mailer like this. What what kind of a report do you get? Is it magazine style? I mean, so so probably similar to the activity guide that we just that we just distributed. So okay. we'd probably do like an everyday every door direct mail. Uh, size so that right. we can send it bulk rate because that's the only way we can get it cheap enough. Um, so we'd go bulk rate instead of first class. You're probably looking at 20 to 24 pages um, is about our max at this price, which I think we could cover kind of what's going on in the city, kind of what, what Denise was saying, kind of the state of the city with that annual report component. Um, so I think the price is pretty conservative, but I certainly understand council members green council member greens concerns. And I, I share those concerns because I do think that we're in a, in a day and age where we need to start moving some of those things digitally at the same time, recognizing we do have residents that don't use email, that don't look at things online. And if you'd like to take a, a turn on the phones, I'm sure our customer folks and service folks would would be happy to to let you talk to some of those residents too. So I think it's a transitionary piece probably right now. But I'm ha happy to answer any other questions about and it. And that's where I'm at with it. I I understand that many are, but not all. And and there's varying degrees of their engagement. And so I think it's important that we not not do I so. guess the, the only other thing I'd add just for you guys to, to kind of all the information in front of you is that the hard costs really typically are in the mailing. Um, mm -hmm. So like reducing the size or something like that doesn't have as big of a financial impact um, as one might think. It, it doesn't change the price a lot. It's that mail that costs. So I guess my question would be, do we anticipate ne next year not worrying about a tax increase? And so, I don't know. It's hard. This is a hard one because I want the residents to have information. I feel like we haven't, we haven't shared stories. We haven't shared information. And so when all you hear is, I want more money, it, I kind of compare that to my teenage kid, right? But I need more. I need more. Well, what do you need it for? I just need more. Well, if you can't tell me why, then the answer is, of course, no. And at the same to return and report, right? <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, having us go through this and eliminate 20,000, they would be appreciative it's of it. Helpful too. Yeah, it's hard. Um, I know we don't have a firm four, so I think this is one that we should ask. Is that okay with you, Kelvin, if we ask this at the next meeting? Yep. Okay, will you remember? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll just keep the I'll just keep the tab where it's at. All right. Anything else under this tab? Um, I guess my question is same page. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering why supplies went up a thousand dollars and thirteen percent. Um, I just as soon reduce that back to 7,500 that it was budgeted last year and keep that flat. You can see though in 2021, the actual was 8,800. Do, do we know why? And do we have an idea what? But this year it's 7,500 and 7,500. Is that an actual, so is that an actual, actual, 
an accurate estimate for this I, year? We don't. It's, we don't know. We were estimating in April. <laughs> it's really hard for us to know. Okay. Okay. But um, yeah, we, we did our best Just to leave estimate. It. Um, I do have a question. Employee recognition, the 50K under the mayor's budget, someplace buried else in this budget. And I don't remember exactly where there's another, uh, there's another amount for employee incentives and stuff. That, it's employee events. It's a non-departmental, right? Yeah. That would be the summer party and okay. help me. So, so they the are Christmas, that, the employee events is the Christmas luncheon and the summer party. Employee recognition is okay. longevity awards, hats off awards, like appreciation awards for outstanding work. Okay. The mayor approved hats off awards? Really? From the department I thought, department I thought heads. they'd be hats on awards. <laughs> That's mm. true. Okay. Does anyone have anything on 74? I do. I want to know, and this, this has to do basically for department heads, so if you're listening... I do not understand why we have goals and performance workload, why we have NAs. Um, I, I just, some, uh, some departments have them and I wanna thank you if your department has them. If you don't have them, I want you to know, I expect to see numbers next year and not just NA because I don't understand for why you can't have any idea of what you're gonna do or what you did do a year ago, so. That's just my soapbox, I guess. <laughs> Councilmember Wylock, I can uh, respond to that. So I did provide a couple of numbers that didn't make it into the, the book based on what we did last year. But because these are new goals, the, the, um, the NAs really are so that we can establish the baseline for this year. And know exactly what we're going to be able to do next year. But um, for instance, the increased participation in the annual business survey, the 2021 actuals, I do have. Uh, I they didn't make it into the to the book, and I can't because reconcile. Why? I, I can't answer that. Oh, okay. They were. Um, I can I can go back okay. and look at correspondence. I think it was an oversight, either on my part or something lost in translation. But I did have okay. Uh, you, no, I did have. No, numbers. your department isn't the only one, so it really yeah. is for all department heads. I think we should have numbers in these spots. Uh, uh, understood, and uh, we showed up agreed. First, and we'll we, we'll make sure that that's <laughs> reckoned that's uh, okay. corrected for next okay. year. Okay, great. But if we have numbers, let's correct them for this year. We'll get them in before we adopt the final. If there are numbers for these, all right, seventy-five. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, based on this year, we, we, we budgeted 10 grand for travel shows. We traveled $500. I also see that we have a membership that we pay for ICSC. And I guess my question is ICSC was a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas. I don't think we sent anybody, did we? And my question is why? why? Why aren't we sending somebody to ICSC to try to bring people to West Jordan? So there are a couple of reasons why we didn't go to ICSC. Um, one, we had a new employee just starting, which we needed to, to train. Two is I, my personal philosophy on ICSC is if we don't have meetings scheduled with brokers and retailers that we're actively trying to bring to the city, then it's, it's not the best use of our time. ICSC this year had about a third of the participation because of COVID and registrations were down uh, significantly when I made the judgment call to not go. I felt like we already have, uh, we're actively engaged with the majority of the brokers on the target retailer list that we already have. And so we looked, we went through and we mapped all of the retailers that were in attendance and all of the brokers that were in, in attendance. And the expense of going was not justifiable from my 
perspective. And, and that was my judgment call. And if that's the case, that if that's the case, then I'm going to say you don't need 10 grand for this next year for travel. So, so I, I, I'd, I'd be willing to slash that. And your uh, counsel, uh, I'll support whatever you, you do with travel. Um, there are very distinct benefits to travel when the situation calls for it. We don't want to be taking trips on the taxpayer dime if it can be avoided. The, the primary use for travel, from my perspective, and we haven't used it in the past because our, our circumstances have been very, very different, and especially through COVID, travel was really a, non, uh, a non-starter for, for various reasons. The bigger issue, though, is we haven't had large industrial or office developments that we needed to go recruit businesses for. At the appropriate time, and we don't have to do this with all recruitment efforts by any stretch, but at the appropriate time, if we're, if we're going after a specific business that we want to come in and we do have a product where they can go, some, someone is invested and built a million square foot building, for instance, it, the message that you send to a business when you take the time to fly to them and go meet them face to face and say, we would like you here in our city, that has a big impact. We use that sparingly um, and, and we can't accurately forecast we're going to need exactly this much. So there is, there is margin built into that, but that is primarily that and travel for ICSC. That's primarily what that line item is for. So uh, I do expect an under expenditure, generally speaking, on this one. Um, and if you guys want to reduce that, don't care. We can always we can always request uh, an amendment if you like. Okay. Um, team, do we want to cut this and what do we want to cut? No, it to? I don't want to cut it just because honestly, travel and expenses are already up 30% just in food and travel in general. So if we cut it and then they go to these events and then we go above and beyond cutting it, then we're gonna be looking at a budget amendment anyways. I agree. With council member Bloom. <laughs> so I'd be specific as to who I'm agreeing with. But $10,000 in travel, that's a lot. And we don't have anything ready to recruit for. And I don't see us having anything ready to recruit for in this year. So I would say we could go to five to it's seven and still be flying. I mean, it's, it's not the, that much. The, uh, the You're not flying first class. <laughs> I've spent 5,000 in one month alone from travel expenses. The travel in this, just to clarify, the travel in this economic development line item is not intended for only Chris to travel. It is intended for. Right. But uh, we're looking at the history that we have, right? Yeah, right, right and we right. understand it was COVID. We're looking at, we have a budget that. Yep. We, we have to then either cut staff, cut expenses, or do a property tax increase, right? So, so I get it. I just want to clarify what the purpose of the it's line has been team. for. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, it's for elected officials, Chris, uh, his team, uh, anyone that we may see needing to go from the city. So that might include public works or others. It's not, that's why his tribal is relatively high proportionate to the size of his department because it is uh, there on an as needed basis. Chris has been very prudent about trying to, as you heard, very careful about trying to not use it just because it's there. Okay. Still feel the same way as that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, supply budget on that one. We went from five to 1500. I don't think we need to triple the budget, but that's me. I'd just as soon drop that back to 500 that it was last year. I'm not going to lose sleep over a $500 limit. Honestly, I support that. I'm sure there was a rationale when I put it in there. I'd have to review my notes, but I don't think that's going to break us either way. So what do you want to do? You want to go to? Put the post-it notes. 500 or 1,000. What did you want, Kelvin? Let's drop a thousand out, go back to 500. I don't care. 
have as it long up. as they're not hurting anything. If he has to walk it. over to the other department to grab the post it notes, <laughs> use their copy. Just to kind of put it in perspective, um, your budget books alone cost three hundred and seventy-five dollars for me to produce on my own. Not like send them out to print and printed or anything. It was buying stuff at Office Depot, your tabs and your binders, and not the paper. Yeah. So that's just perspective as to what the office supplies cost. So if he needed to produce something, a report or something that he wants to send out or canvas, that would limit him substantially. Yeah, I I could do a thousand, but I couldn't cut it down to five. Because we already spent 800 in 2021. So can we agree on a thousand? I can. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that page? Okay. 76. I have a question on the difference with, from two, 225 to 75 for the marketing and public outreach on line 12. You probably knew that was coming. <laughs> I did. I was well poised to answer your question. So one of the things that we're trying to do is work with Denise on best practices. And one of the things that you've done in the last two years is to move expenses to the appropriate department. So for instance, this year we moved part of that 225 is moving some IT expenses that were in my department that really should belong in the IT department. The other part of that is my department really is a service organization to other departments, whether that's the council office or the mayor's office or the public works department. And so um, just kind of based on those same best practices, we're trying to put those costs in the appropriate department so it's easier for you to account for. So for instance, the activity guide that we just sent out, that has previously been in my budget. We moved that to the events division budget so that we could see, okay, this is how much it costs us to publicize the events that we're doing. So that's where you're seeing some of that difference. And then the rest of the costs are more for general communications costs that we do on behalf of the whole city. For example, the West Shore Journal is a cost that would come out of my department because it can't be costed out to a single department. Does that, mm -hmm. great. Okay, are we ready to turn the page? Yep, I'm sure you've got a couple of comments. <laughs> so do I. Go ahead. Uh, no, I'm going to let you go first on this one. Okay, I'll go first. All right, I have a couple of things that I'd like to discuss. Um, one, never mind, because of the annual resident budget. Well, when when's anticipated that that would go for next year? The annual report. Uh, the annual resident budget report. Yeah. So um, the annual report we have, we, we actually met with um, the council office director and Corbin to talk over next year to make sure we were getting both perspectives and make sure we have a calendar set. So we have an annual report slated for January and then a budget document um, slated for a kind of a May time frame. May? Uh-huh. Does that work? Well, we did it this year, but it's got to be first of May. Yeah. We're not going to wait as long as it has it go out the 20th. Yeah. The 20th of May again. Yeah. Okay. It's got to be done so that it's in the mail by April 30th or 1st of May. Is that doable? For me, it's doable. I think the bit better question is will the budget information, the numbers be available that early? But it, it's going to, I'm going to tell you it will be. Because I think that what we're going to do, at least my proposal to the council come uh, for next calendar year is that we're going to move a regular council meeting to the 1st of May and the budget has to be presented to us on the very first week of May to give us more time to deal with the budget. So the answer to that is... Uh, we, we ought to be pretty close with the budget being done by the 1st of May. And even numbers, if it's done by I the 1st of May, it goes into the mail on the 2nd or 3rd. That's good. But yeah. the, uh, the challenge with a, a mailer about the budget hitting homes the 1st of May is that mailer has to be prepared about the 1st of April. And that's where I think it may be pushing it in the budget process and budget timing. Just because you need about, correct me, Tawny, how, you need about three so, to four weeks we need 10 days, 10 business days for printing, and we need about 10 business days for mailing. Honestly, no, we don't. It, 
I do Salt Lake mailing on my campaigns and it's four to four uh, or five days. It's usually first class mail though. Like All the minutes. budget mailer we just sent out was sent first class mail. It was very, very expensive for us to send it that way. We can send your budget mailer out first class mail, but we need to significantly increase the budget to do so. I know it was $11,000 this year, wasn't it, Alan? That's correct. And we got $10,000 sitting here. I don't see much of a difference. But that's me. So, so any other comments about that one? Uh, I just need to know that it's going to go out before we're making budget decisions because otherwise it's not worth sending. Basically, it needs to be so that people are made aware and that they have the opportunity to come. Um, the one that I, I want to cut personally is the West Jordan Journal, which might kind of sound odd after I just said I believe in paper. But my concern with the West Jordan Journal is we have a mayor that hand delivers one to a resident because they don't get it in the mail. And I know sometimes mine has been hit and miss. And currently, we're spending $30,000. I want a local newspaper, but I think we've got too many pages. So I want to cut this down. I don't think we need the number of pages that we've got every month. So, so we proposed that to the Western Journal and they said there will be no discount for cutting the number of pages. So it's an all or nothing for th for situation for us right now. The mayor and I have talked at length about this. Um, I, I, think you're spot on. Um, I, I don't think everybody in the city receives this. And I think we could, and the mayor agreed after the, we had this discussion, sorry, after the budget went out, that we could start looking at phasing this out and bumping up email. The cost would end up being about the same. If we carried the West Jordan Journal through the end of our contract period and bumped up our email services, the cost ends up being about the same. So let me get this straight. They don't want us to take out two full page ads, which would be significantly less than 30,000 a year. So we can either do nothing or, or 30,000. I've talked to the West Jordan Journal about this specifically and asked them if we reduce the number of pages in half, if we could drop the, the amount we spend with them. And he told me that He's already done that for us and we're at a bare minimum with him. So we, there would not we be. used to have two pages. Now we have six. I don't, that doesn't, I don't know the historical me. background. So I'm just giving you the feedback I received, which was there is not wiggle room for them to drop the number that the price for us. And so, um, when's our contract up? I, uh, we just need to give them an end date. We have a window that we have to, I think it's nice. Don't quote me. I, it's 60 to 90 days. I can't remember. I'd have to look at that. Uh, I'm not in favor of this. Uh, are the rest of you in favor? I'm, of I'm good with eliminating it. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not good with this. I mean, uh, a full page ads, $800 or something like that. If I remember, if I remember right from a few months ago, uh, full page ad is $800 we could do something and put a QR code and a link and I don't know. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm not good with, I, I don't know how we communicate, but that 30 K because my neighborhood doesn't even get, it. I know I live on the periphery. You know, I live on the 13th West side of the city. Uh, my neighborhood doesn't even get the West Jordan Journal. So uh, there's there's a swath of neighborhood in my area that doesn't even see this. And you're not the only area. That's correct. And I'm not the only area. So I get it almost every month. <laughs> um, might I make a su suggestion? Um, I would be happy to come back with you with an alternative proposal that leans heavier on digital um, communication with our residents and phases out the journal. So we're not stopping at cold turkey and we can give people the time to transition. Also, um, we what we would probably do as part of that is uh, print an insert for our utility mailer. And I just need to speak with data pros. I, I think I know how much that will cost, but I need to make sure 
that we've got those costs nailed down so that we could still reach the people that are getting paper billing and that we don't normally email. And that way we're covering kind of both sides of things. Okay, so team, I propose that we take it. I would rather do a budget amendment than leave it at 30,000 is where I'm at. Because I think if we leave it at 30,000, that sends a message that we're okay and I'm not okay. So would anyone be, would the three of you, since how that's what really matters tonight, be opposed to saying, we're gonna put it down to 20 for now and see what Miss Barker can come back with us. 20, see if I can do it really quick for you. 20, 20 in a transition for six or six to eight months, yeah. I'd be good with that. I think that's pretty fair. Just quick math, which I'm everyone in the room will know I'm terrible at. <laughs> um, but my quick math would be that we'd be right around 2021 20, to cover an insert in our utility bills and upgrade our email services to be able to distribute to the whole city. Yeah, I like that the way that's going. Okay. Yep. You okay? That's fine. Okay. okay. So you have four. This is to go to 20, and then we'll have a transition and you'll report back. Okay. I Thank you. Yep. So I, the next one, I just have a question. Yep. We really spend 25K on Facebook. Uh, we do. We spend a significant amount um, a couple different ways. <laughs> um, we're trying to move to more of a digital medium. So we're trying to move away from some of the traditional advertising we're doing um, on radio, uh, in particular with the Western Stampede. Um, because we have to phase it, we've bumped this up a little. I'm hoping we don't have to spend that much, but this is also what we're hoping we can help with. So when you talk about making sure we're telling our story about the finances of the city and when we're talking about tax increase, you guys might have noticed that people don't always pay attention to those posts. So sometimes people will share a post about food truck night 81 times, <laughs> and we have one share on a post about finances that actually happened this week. Um, increasing the budget there would allow us to get more views on those posts and hopefully use it that way. Um, we put this in there uh, to do a trial run this year um, where we've increased or decreased some other costs, but I'd be amenable to adjusting that if, if you think that's appropriate. I was just and following asking, your direction. Right? At the end of the day, it's kind of, it, it's kind of your choice, you know, if, well, it's not kind of, it is your choice <laughs> um, as to whether you want to push things more digitally or more in print. And this is, this budget was our hope of kind of creating a transitional year in that. Okay. I'm good okay. with that. We will be judicious and we will try to spend it as wisely as possible. And if we don't need to spend it, we won't spend it. So now I'm going to move into a policy question for the four of us. Um, the budget's not that much, so I, it's not that I'm worried about the 10K. But philosophically, we're spending 10K on video production banners, and we know that we, when we have Western Stampede, we have a banner over here and a couple other places. My question would be, would it be better and it might take some money out of reserve or capital improvement or shifting around. But would we be better off having some digital signs and eliminating uh, printing banners as often as we do? Is that a question for me? Or well, it's a question, it might be a question, for a, a question for the rest of the council, too. So I think one of the most surprising things to me after I started working here was every time we do an event or an activity, we ask people where they heard about it. And the most shocking thing in the world to me has been how many people say they saw it on a banner. I never would have guessed. Typically, um, our largest is always Facebook, which is why we're kind of trying to push more that direction. But I was absolutely blown away, away by the number of people that actually say they find out about our events from a banner. Interestingly, we've also tested a lot of our marketing on the electronic sign out in front of city hall. We've never had anyone say that they that saw our event. I thought that it sign is now, broke. but it wasn't when I started and we've been doing this for three years now. We've never had anyone say that the digital signage, that digital signage was helpful. So um, if we wanted to invest in digital signage, it would need to be more, I think, than that sign. I know Harriman has a couple 
those are very large, very expensive, several hundred thousand dollar signs that they've installed. Um, just kind of to give you guys some perspective of, of where people hear about things from. West Jordan Journal typically ranked fairly low. Facebook was always pretty high. Instagram is pretty high. So social media usually pushes out, but that's because that's what our, we're sending. I think if we were sending a, a twice a month email out to residents, that would rank the highest. Direct. Well, we, we probably ought to look and see if we can gather text because sometimes we are text, doing that. text works. Actually, text gets a better read than email does. It does. It pops up and yeah, I, I learned that as well. So. Yeah, we have about right now, it's something we're not pushing just because we don't have the staff bandwidth to, to manage it well. And if we do something, we want to do it well. But um, we have collected so far without even pushing it about 4,000 phone numbers that have signed up for our text service. Um, the texting system we have set up is really good. Um, so my hope is that we can start pushing that more this year. And if we're not putting as much time into the West Jordan Journal, that will free up a significant amount of staff time in the month that I think we could put more work into, again, that email side of things and the text side of things. Okay. Anything right. else on this page? I like your banners. I do think that we could have them say, and change the dates instead of replacing the banner every time. But ban banners that draw my attention. And for some reason, I do remember it more because there happens to be this sign right over by the railroad tracks that I've read how many times? And tonight, what did I do? Ah, oh, shoot, I forgot. Luckily, it's easy to still get here, but you know, that's me. All right, moving on to administrative services. Is there anything in this group that you all have? Oh, come on, we can't let her get away with nothing. <laughs> okay. I don't have anything until page 84. I was just curious oh, well, on what administrative other services. supplies on page 80 and what that is and how, why it's gone up. It's the same as department supplies. I just <clears throat> didn't get the verbiage correct on that. Okay, so that's department supplies. The part, um, and then the cost uh, rise on that of what? Oh, the the increase in cost from ninety five hundred to twelve thousand. Which line are you on? Oh, it's line eleven. Line Thank eleven you. on page eighty. Yeah, eighty. Yeah, yeah. It tends to be more towards what. Our supplies are in general. Oh, you can see equipment maintenance supplies went down significantly and we put them into other supplies. Okay. All right. Anything on page 81? What's the next page you have, folks? I have 84. 84. Okay. And and Scott, you may get stuck with this one. Um, <laughs> we we have we have $7,000 allocated for public noticing and legal advertisements. Do we, do we still have the, we don't have a requirement for legal advertisement anymore. The only requirement we have is public noticing with the 300 feet because the public notice website doesn't cost us anything, right? So isn't that right, Cindy? You're right. The public notice website does not cost. So anything, do we I really send? Do we really spend seven thousand dollars in mail notifying residents of public hearings? Okay. Let's. I think Cindy had a little more oh. to share. We've actually reduced that significantly as well. Okay. Anything else under this tab? Any pages? Hold on. I, I have a note here, and I don't know. Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. No. Okay. My note was. But the, yeah, my note was that, so, okay. Okay, are we ready to go on to legal services? Um, hold on, I have, I have a couple of notes here. Human, resor human resources, page 86. Okay. Corbin, you may be able to answer this one better. Um, What, what, 
why did we go from and I'll just I'll just lump a couple of these together. Why did we why did we go to thirty thousand dollars for educational assistance when we don't use that when we had didn't you haven't used that much the last two years? And why did we jump um, on citywide training a hundred and forty six percent? We have a couple of goals. Um, one, we want to do better training and more training. For example, uh, I've asked for our department heads to have outward mindset training and specifically uh, some outward mindset training and customer service training for specific departments like community development. In order to accommodate that, we increase the uh, citywide training budget. Um, we take advantage of that outward mindset training specifically whenever we have in-house facilitators like in our police department. But uh, we have not done a lot of train, you know, kind of broad-based professional development training for our employees and we want to make that a bigger priority. Similarly, with our education assistance program, we have proposed through this budget process increasing the tuition reimbursement program from $1,500 cap from a $1,500 cap to a $3,000 cap. Um, historically, uh, we have run out of money in that line item. We aren't, we didn't, uh, we're not there this year um, because we've had uh, just, it's been harder. It's been a little bit hard to utilize at $1,500 cap. We've had a little less motivation. Part of our mantra, mantra has been, we're going to support you to develop yourself. We want you to he stay here in West Jordan for your whole career. And we're going to give you the tools to make this a great career by supporting you with in-house training and with uh, your education. And part of that was bumping up that tuition reimbursement line. $1,500 used to cover a semester of tuition. It doesn't anymore. Okay. Corporate didn't. Corbin alluded to it, but he wasn't real clear. There was there are a lot of employees who turned down that training and didn't do any training at all because it wasn't enough to cover it. And so that's why it didn't get spent. They didn't even apply for it. So we're bumping up so they will apply and use it. All right. Um, page 87, next question. We really spend $8,000 recruiting employees. Where, where, where do we, it says public notices. Recruitment advertising. Um, we just put it in the same thing so that we can do those lump sum kind of, all right, what did it, what did advertising cost overall or what kind of things? So yes, we do um, in Indeed, LinkedIn, um, some okay. of the other processes and then KSL as well. We pay for all of that advertising. Okay. Just so everybody's aware, we're an hour into our two and a half hours, and we're 90 pages through a 333-page budget. Just... So you're impressed? Is that what you just said? <laughs> okay. Are we ready to go to legal services or utility I, billing? First? I had one more okay. question with utility billing. Sure. Um, because we've gone to online and all that stuff, I don't see much. I don't see the savings for the 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 bill. Can you when we're not mailing ten thousand, fifteen thousand, seventeen thousand bills a month? Where where are we saving that at? There's still the push out too. There's a there like similar to what Tony just said. There isn't a ton of savings going from paper to electronic outside of environmental savings. But because you are still paying someone to distribute that information and to produce that information. So we send the file to data pros. They massage it into a nice form, right, our new utility bill. And then they print those that want to be printed. And 60% of them are pushed out online. But um, processing that data and putting that into that format does cost additional money. So there is some savings. And there may be some more additional savings as we continue to work with them. But we also are continuing to grow as well with our customer base. Are all new accounts going to automatically paperless? I'm sorry. What? Are all new accounts automatically paperless? Um, they are not. They have to opt into the program. Mm -hmm. Can they opt out instead? Um, yes, we could try that because that might I don't might, might help. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, I most I, people opt in. We're at like over 65% now. It's I'd like, rather them opt so out awesome. of, of I'd rather them do the opposite. So it's automatically online. You're in. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome if we start training them that way. Yeah. Intuitively, it just seems like we should be saving more money by not sending 17, 18,000 bills by US mail out. I think one of the costs that was missing in here um, was that we were printing them in-house so we were printing them on paper and those supplies were being paid for somewhere else in a central supply budget instead of in utility billing because they were using a main copier so it was the copy cost it was copier cost it was paper cost and then we were putting them into we were having state mail put them in the envelopes and process them that way so i think there is still savings in here it's probably just not as clear as it could have been had we put all of the cost of the of production in here in general, as well as a staff member to do that production as well. Okay. Legal services. Anyone have anything there? Um, Rob, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay? I just wondered on the, this is going to be the weird question is we dropped in professional and technical services from 191,000 to 91,000, are you still gonna have enough money in your budget to cover outside counsel? Yeah, let me, thank you for asking. If you remember, that was $100,000 for land use. Go ahead, Rob. Why can't part we hear him? Part of what I'm working with. Uh, Rob, we can hardly hear you. I'm sorry, is this any better? A tiny bit. I think it's a volume switch somewhere in the room as well. I had to guess. Go, go, keep going, Rob. We can. We'll, we'll strain to hear you. I'm sorry. I'm. I've got this on as high as I can. I. Can you hear me now? Is that any better? More or less. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. There we uh, go. The one comment I wanted to make. On and now you went away there. Uh, they're playing with our cat. My mic got significantly louder. Is this any better now? Yes. Go so ahead, Rob. Are you able to hear me? Yes, go ahead, okay, please. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I'm working on with the Division of Risk Management and with the attorneys is whenever we have these outside counsel fees uh, to examine how we're, how we're um, accounting for those. Um, uh, a significant portion of this year was finishing up the legal work uh, for uh, the one uh, land use application that we had. Um, and I think 91,000 is probably a good number. Um, if we have, for example, uh, this next year, by the time we finish the grandma litigation, uh, we will probably have expended about seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars by the time that's open, or by the time that's finished. Um, when we have these types of uh, lawsuits where they don't fit neatly into either uh, professional services for something we've anticipated, or they don't fit neatly into our insurance coverage, those are the ones that uh, I want to re-examine and take a look at. And so, for example, when we did the Knife River litigation, as an example, we made a conscious decision that our goal was going to be to recover those uh, outside attorney fees from the project costs, and we were able to do that. Um, with the, uh, the grandma lawsuit, that was one that we did not anticipate uh, taking on, and those types of lawsuits are not covered uh, necessarily with our insurance and if they are we have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar deductible so I would suggest that we leave it at ninety one thousand if, if we do encounter one of these lawsuits that doesn't fit into those categories neatly uh, then my recommendation is that uh, I take a look at that with the insurance broker with the mayor and then we come back to the council if we need additional revenues I don't think we need to budget for more <coughs> than the ninety one and if we do, we probably ought to have a discussion with the council about why we're doing that. Great. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Rob, while you're still on the, the phone. Yes. 
the 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 books and subscriptions under the prosecution is that because of the case management system uh is that why it went up so high from two to twelve yeah the first okay. year when we implemented that i wanted to have that coming out of the the budget that i actually i mean i oversee the whole office but i specifically deal with the general counsel budget i put that in that budget for the first year as implementing it because i wanted to we had some issues we were dealing with the contract with the um, Utah Prosecution Council, and I, I wanted to keep an eye on, on those expenditures. Now okay. that the software has been implemented, we've transferred that annual subscription from general counsel. That's why you see a, a $14,000 decrease, and we put that into the prosecution budget. So that's why that went up. Okay, no problem. Yeah, and can I just comment, uh, Council Member Whitelock, Chairman Whitelock, on, on one thing, on the uh, general counsel performance and workload measures. Sure. Um, I wasn't going to comment on this, and actually, I'm glad you brought up NA because you'll notice we have an NA there under general counsel. Um, last year, you funded the practice management software, and we're about uh, three weeks away from doing our beta test on that, which I'm very pleased with. Two, four of those measures uh, deal with us now being able to track the timing on work that comes in. And I'm very curious to see, and if you look on page, uh, let me scroll down here. I'm using a fairly small screen. It looks like it's page um, 92, where we have those uh, workload measures. Uh, two of the things I want to track is the number of requests that come into the office within two weeks of the date that the requester wants the work done. And I'm going to measure those both in terms of the number of matters and the percentage of those matters. The other one is number of work requests which come within the two week period of when they're scheduled for the council to review and the percentage of those. Um, obviously there's things that come in at the last minute and have to come in. Uh, other times there's things that probably could have come in earlier and I wanna track those more than anything to just give the, the lawyers and the department heads an idea of what the workflow is that's coming into the office. I think that can help not only the attorneys uh, be more efficient and effective, but I think it can help us as, a, as a, an entire organization to look at where the work's coming from and what the timing of it is. And that's not to point fingers at anyone, it's to identify, give us an idea uh, exactly of, of what the timing is. Some things just we simply can't expect sooner than we get them. Other things I think we could uh, expect sooner and I'd like to see what those are. Okay. And I've, I've never had the ability to track that in the past. That's why there's NA for the prior years, and I don't have any numbers yet. Our goal is to man manage all of our matters with file buying, and that's why the percentage is there, 100% each on line two and line four. Uh, the number of matters, I don't know. We'll know this next year for the first time. Okay, thank you. All right, Justice Court. Community of development. No. Public works. I have on page 115 a couple of things. Oh, at which which really this is just for Corbin, if you'll just listen and pass it on to staff. I just these two employees that are being hired, I just we really need to disclose that. What they're applying for and being hired for is possibly a short-term job, right? A two-year commitment or something because it's for the fiber. So I just think it's important that we handle that well. So I hope you do. You're talking about the engineering inspector position specifically with the fiber, uh, yes. fiber data, fiber yes. installed. Yes. So I just, please. Um, okay, public utility, anything else in that one? No, public utilities. How about public service? Um, I do on page 136, 136. And this is just a question, and I don't know that I really have an opinion one way or the other, but I think it's a question we should ask. 
do we want to continue to send out an annual events guide book? Opinions, Zach? It's kind of the same thing we've already kind of talked about. It's just the different, a different content. It's should we do it? Yes, we should do it. But should we transfer it to digital eventually? Yes, we should. So, yes, we should for now. Okay, Pamela. I agree with Council Member. Uh, Whoever he is down there, yeah. that guy. <laughs> the dude down there in the corner. I never drank coffee today. I think my brain is freaking out. <laughs> Okay, just wanted to ask the question. I, I know there were issues this year with this one, mail and all that other nonsense that we've seen, but uh, we need to try to make sure that's out by the end of April. So that, that, the advance guide? Yep. So that it actually hits for the song, so that it hits the residents the first or second week of May because. Then you're going to have both this and the budget at the same time. Well, we want that. It's stagger them, but the events guide doesn't do any good if it gets hung up in the mail for whatever reason. And we're June 1st and 10,000 people in the city haven't seen it yet. And two yeah. events are already over. Super frustrating. It is. I'm one of the 10, I can't people. even I can't even tell you how frustrated I am by this. They've actually had the events guide at the mail house for over four weeks. So it wasn't a question of delivering it to them in time. They've had the printing house had it in March. It's just a question of the post office issue. And we've been delayed because we did a bulk rate mail on this one. So I, I'd like to say there's nothing we can do about it. And I have to say the irony in all of this is. I'm feeling what our residents sometimes feel. I'm going to a government agency and saying, why isn't this happening? And I can't really tell them I'm taking my business elsewhere. <laughs> so super frustrating. I completely agree with you. Well, and, and, and so I agree with council member Jacob. This is, this is one where uh, I think we can use email, text, find your annual events guide at this link.com uh print it on the back of the envelope of the, the utility mailers uh some of those kind of things to help if there are those kind of issues so we can transition away from this yeah i think we i think we need to look at transitioning away from this and not spending twenty thousand dollars every year I appreciate that. And I, I understand the position you guys are in really protecting the taxpayer's dollar of all the mailers. Um, the one that lives in households the longest is this one. People tend to put it on their refrigerators. We get questions about it and comments about it all summer long. So that's the thing that I, I think I encourage you to keep in mind. And the thing that I would ask of you is help us consider ways that we can make this even more valuable. If this is something that's going to live on their fridge all summer long, what can we do for you that this would make this a more valuable piece in your eyes? I think we're really open to that and, and would welcome that feedback. Um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can to produce, but I think everybody has ideas about that. So as things come to mind, send them my way so I can make note of them for the future because this is one of those pieces that people kind of hang on to. Here's, here's one of my thoughts. If we're going yeah. to continue to do this, um, and I know this is thinking outside the box, but there are lots of businesses in West Jordan that have summer activities. Why don't we reach out? I, I think we probably ought to reach out to the chamber, both chambers, business license people, and if they're doing, you know, we, you know, Salt Lake County, yeah. have them, have them pay an ad in the paper and give them a coupon for 50% off for a swimming pool admission. And the, 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 the events, whatever that place is that has the trampolines and the, the other stuff out of Jordan <laughs> Landing. I've never been there. I've driven past it 10,000 times. Green minds think alike. We're, we've started down that path. You probably noticed that this year we did include the county in it. Part of that inclusion was also letting them know that there's probably going to be a price tag for inclusion in future publications, um, which will help offset some of the costs. 
In terms of going to private entities, that's probably a, a bandwidth issue that we'd have to look at or contract something like that out. But I think it's a smart idea and it's a way we can learn, uh, we can kind of lean on other entities to help us uh, cover costs on something like that. So it's fantastic. Uh, if my, my thought is if we start gathering business license email addresses uh, we do. And, and we've got a good database, we can email them and say, you want to put a coupon, you want to put an ad in the West Jordan Summer Activity Guide, it'll cost you X number of dollars. We do. We piloted it. You, you'll probably remember back to during COVID, we did kind of a, a coupon program. We did it through the journal in this case, but we did reach out to that database. Um, I'll say there wasn't a tremendous amount of interest from private businesses at that time. And I don't know if that was due to COVID or not, um, but we didn't get great feedback from them. Uh, however, I still think it's a really good idea and it's one that we'll definitely look into and pursue. Thank you. And right. I got one last question on public services. We skipped the page, but I'm just going to ask Denise. Do we need currently the cemetery? I'm going to go back to the cemetery. Uh, the cemetery, um, we we fund that out of the general fund. We do. At what point in time do we need to? I have a question on that. I'll be looking it up while you're talking. Figuring, figuring out how we do a, and it may take, and it may take a couple of two or three years to trans, tra, you know, to transition. But at some point in time, shouldn't particularly the fact that that cemetery is getting full, we probably need to look at a perpetual maintenance fund. Correct. Um, yes, the, the difficult part is that it is already built in to the cemetery fees right now, um, and we've been living on it. So that's where the challenge is, is if I take that away and put it into a perpetual care fund, which is a, a great idea, and we've done, I've done it before, um, but we would have to replace that revenue somewhere else. How much so, is so here's the idea to replace the revenue. If you turn in your fee schedule to page nine, my proposal is, um, am I in the right place? Not that one, wherever the cemetery is in here. Somewhere in here is the cemetery internment fees and plot fees. And I think we need to look at increasing those for non-residents. It's uh, page seven, actually. I, I suggest we increase for non-residents because it's really a service for our residents and and we only have so many plots left. And in our market, the way it's supposed to go is supply and demand, right? Well, our supply is pretty low. So I would like to encourage us to say we want to raise our plot <laughs> at the very least. So um, is, there, is there an appetite from the three of you to raise the plot price? I'm in support of that. I'd, I'd go for that. I saw a smile from the black back row. Uh, uh, so how do we want to handle that? Do we want to ask staff to, to see what, or do we just want to set a fee? I propose a 25% increase. If I would, I would ask that we uh, ask Isaac and his staff to work with the administrative services division and bring back to you a proposal, knowing the majority of you are in support of that. Okay. okay. I, I'm happy to look at all those fees for that, but definitely the plot needs to go up. Thank you. Sorry, Kelvin. No, you're, <coughs> you just brought up the cemetery. I think that to, um, in, for purposes of transparency and understanding, it would be best if we probably separated those fees so that the plot fee is this much, but this much of it goes to perpetual care and this much of it goes back into the recovery of the land cost. And so that so might be can, more clear, or we take a policy of every plot we sell goes to perpetual care. And then the services to open and close the plot are um, absorbed by the, or should be paid in full, right? There should be cost recovery plus a little. Um, so I think that those are things that we probably could explore during a work session is how we wanna to get to that perpetual care fund. And then um, do we want to dedicate a piece of it to the perpetual care fund and really make that clear in that consolidated fee schedule so that 
when others are standing in our shoes that that, that doesn't get mixed up again. Yeah, I, yeah. I like that. I like that idea of at least starting. Uh, if we don't start, we're never going to do it. All right. Was there anything under the last tab? Otherwise, we'll go on to police department. Okay, does anyone have under under police department anything? Hold on, I do. Okay. <laughs> um, do we know what, oh, that was the, that was a shift in cost in the, op, the fleet operations that went from 1,400 to 16K. Uh, that's just a fleet. That's just a cost recovery. Cost recovery for the replacement of new cars. Yes. Okay. So the next one that I want to talk about is page 154. My binder got all messed up here. And and there's $9,000 for mailing costs for pet license renewals. <laughs> We're actually so excited to tell you that we are going to online license renewals. So um, you'll see that there is that $3,840 for the software licensing. We're transitioning to online renewals this year. Um, we may have to have some mailing costs. This is a transition year for us to let people know that this will be the last year they'll receive their notice by mail and that in the future that they'll receive it by email or they'll need to go online and renew their um, pet licensing. So Good. definitely be looking at that one to get reduced very quickly. We're super excited about that. Cool. Anything else on um, police? No? Okay, we'll move to fire. I don't know. Derek's sitting back there. Let's pick this budget apart. <laughs> you know what? I do have one question, Chief, and I didn't finish going through it. Yeah, come on up. It, but you gave us a really good spiral bound. Here's our plan. And I was going to compare the two and I haven't. So can you just tell me from your plan, what have I got in here? Are we, are we, you don't remember it? <laughs> could, could, could you press the button on the right? Thank you, Is that better? I'm just trying to make sure, I, I've got a few of those. So I'm trying to think which one, just our strategic plan probably. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. Um, <clears throat> If you'll look as well, our goals have been updated from previous years, and those goals reflect that strategic plan. plan. Those are the goals that we've been working on as a department. We have completed many of them, but those are still kind of, this is kind of the guiding document for what we're trying to accomplish and do. And so this time I included that whole thing in our goals. Um, so are you wanting to know like where we're at with that? I just or? wanted to make sure that you're using it. Yes to guide what you're doing yep, here in our budget. Okay, yep. that's yep. all I needed. Thank okay. you. <clears throat> Anyone have anything else in fire? Mm -hmm. Apparently not. <sighs> Another one gets off easy. <laughs> um, let's go to non-departmental. Uh, oh yeah, we're gonna talk about this one. Yeah. Here goes the last hour, 5088. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot in this one. Who wants to start this topic? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start and I'm going to start with what I've heard from council member Worthen because I think it's probably a good thought. And so we'll start with line three and the, the current dollar amount is 60K. And, and I do think that at it, whether it's this year or starting next year that we should do it First, we need to decide what that number is for this year, because I've been told by our attorney that the dollar amount we determine. So it can be 60. It doesn't have to be 60. Our contract doesn't require that. It just says we'll, we'll partner with them. And council member Worthen's thought is that we should give them a, a, a guaranteed amount, but then for above that, it's a matching grant. I think that's a great idea. Um, Thoughts? I also agree with a certain amount and then above that a matching as well. I think that's a good incentive. I don't want to, I'm not sure I want to do that this year though. The, 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 the problem is, is that they're transitioning. The problem is, is that they're transitioning out of COVID and to impose that requirement now, I'm not sure 
how successful that would be. I'd say let's let's come up with a good number this year, and then next year um, come up with what we want to do for matching. Okay, so do we want to go with the sixty k for this year? Thoughts? When will they get the sixty k? They just got thirty k recently, right? So when will this sixty k go into? So it go if we do a matching, if we put a matching on here now, that won't go in effect till necessarily we have a year. Yeah, because exactly. they get this money. Yeah, so Basically we have a year, budget year right? during this trend. Am I right, Corbin? Because they have to do their next financials and then they get a... So we have recently given them 30000 which was the FY22 distribution, and 60000 excuse me, the FY21 distribution. It's, it's already... <laughs> uh, the FY21 distribution was 30000 That was withheld, you know, 15 months. Uh, 60,000 for the current fiscal year distribution. Um, once it's in the budget, as Rob mentioned last uh, oh, a couple council meetings ago, once it's in the budget, um, it's it's technically there and they could get it at the start of that fiscal year. We have not typically given it to them until they've come and report, which has been in the spring. Um, what we talked about, as I recall, a couple of months, a couple of meetings ago was changing the name of this line item with this line item being called Community Arts Council, um, it ties to their contract. We had discussed changing the name of this line item, uh, leaving it a, the same amount, changing the name of the line item so it doesn't tie directly to their contract, so it's not appropriated to the uh, Cultural Arts Society directly, and then we can make the contract adjustments we talked about at a previous meeting. It's in the budget, it's built into the budget, but it's not appropriated directly to them. So that lets us make it? those, that lets us make those uh, contract adjustments. We talked about calling it um, community, what did we talk about? Uh, community, say that again. No, he's not. I said beautification, <laughs> but you know, community beautification. No, we talked about community, um, Community outreach. It was some. It was kind of a broad, generic name. Community engagement or. Community enhancement. Sorry, Rob, speaking up. I'm sorry. I think it was something like community enhancement or something. Enhancement. Like that. It was. A, yeah. It was. A, yeah. It was a generic term that let us use it for the arts council, but didn't directly appropriate it to the arts council. That's right. I. I think that. <sighs> I think that it's fair to say like we'd do 50 and they could get up to 60 if they did 10 on their own. I mean, as a, tra as a transition and first yeah. transition. Yeah. I don't, <sighs> or even 55. I don't, I think that they have a whole year. I, I, I think what you're talking about is not a, is, um, not necessarily a bad proposal, but I think we need to build into that with the new contract. And I think we ought to have Vic here to see, all right, how does that impact you guys if we make that change? But we are we are starting to work with them on updating the contract according to the feedback we got from the council a couple of meetings ago. Okay. So I guess the question before us team is, do we want to change the name to something a little more generic? Do we want to leave it at 60K? We could just change it to just community arts in general, and then it isn't tied to their contract specifically. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's do community arts. Are we in favor of that? Is that okay? Yeah, uh, I can do can, that. Okay. Rob, can can I ask Rob to chime in on that comment? I don't yeah, know. If, can we hear it? Whatever we, we name it, it's it's the Community Arts Society. Is that the name of the 501c? No, it's um, the West Jordan Cultural, Cultural Arts, Arts Society. Society of West Jordan, C-A-S-W-J. Okay, thank you. I think then if you call it community arts, that's enough for you to say the money is not appropriated to the society, but it's set aside as a line item for the council and mayor to negotiate a new contract. And then in that contract, you can identify how much of the community arts line item will go to the society and in what payments. Okay. So and then we'll need to change the description on page 170. This is for Becky's um, input that specifically take out that it's the annual contribution to the West Jordan Cultural Arts Society. So it will just be community arts, and then we'll say to manage the community arts program. Sounds good. So the, my question was, my, my question is, they were supposed to report in March. That was supposed to be for this, 
that's not for the FY that we were in. That's for the FY. That's for the FY coming up. Correct. Yes, they are supposed to provide the council a plan for the upcoming year, and based on that report, then you choose to appropriate the money. And, and that's why making this a more generic line item gives you some some time uh, to number one, I guess, decide if the report was adequate. But number two, then to decide if you're going to allocate money uh, under what those conditions will be. And that's the contract amendment or the new contract that we would prepare. You're absolutely right, Council okay. Member Green. They should be reporting to you what they've accomplished with the money that you gave them from the previous year in March and the plan going forward so you can decide what kind of allocation you want for the next budget year. And, and I know that they're they're changing to a, and and this, this is the timing issue. And I, I think that because they just got 90K, uh, I think we can probably work with this, but they're changing to match our fiscal year for their tax year. Um, having them report in March is probably dumb. Um, when their tax year is not quite over, we, you know, they're in the last quarter of their tax year. That doesn't quite make sense. So, um, and, and so we talked about this with the contract is that we, when, when we come up with the contract, we'll need to figure out at what point in time do they provide the report. We can allocate money now, but based on their report and their request, about the time their taxes are due, October, then we could allocate it for, and actually they'd be better off. And, and, and Corbin, this may be something, they may be better off going calendar year, right? If they went calendar year instead of our fiscal year and they did it from January to January, they'd be able to do the, the calendar year from January to January and keep the same March report and go in and then we would give it to them. But their accounting year is January to January and our, our allocation is mid is mid tax year. Does that make sense? So it may be something that as you're talking about the contract, what's the best timing for, for the allocation in, in the budget, if that makes sense. Duly noted, thank you. Mr. Anderson, did you have something? I was just going to add a couple of meetings ago when we talked about um, the contract, there was a discussion of the, the Arts Society moving to a July to June fiscal year. And that it, uh, <clears throat> with that, there would be a benefit for them in the current contract making a request, which is normal, and that that would occur in March during our budget process. And then they would report when they completed their taxes later in the year, and that's when the distribution could take. And that way, it's a system and a process that ties in with what the city's doing with what they're doing, that there would be a request for funds uh, as per the uh, current agreement, depending on how you amend it. And then the reporting would happen in the fall when they have their uh, fiscal year complete and then can be dispersed at that point. Whatever works, Corbin, as we work on that contract. Okay, um, moving on, what else from page 169? I have a question on historical society. Okay. Historical committee. Um, it shows that the budget this year was fifty five hundred, and that, that was expended for fifty five hundred. What did we? That's a the historical committee or historical society is a five hundred one c three, correct? And how come we're we don't get a report from them? And what did we see for the fifty five hundred dollars? Because I don't think we saw the museum open at all this year. We, we did not. That's why it hasn't been distributed. It's in the budget. We have a contract okay. with them. The 5,500 helps cover the uh, utility costs of the building. Uh, we help with some landscape of the grounds. Uh, they did not open, at least not much at all. Hence, we have not distributed those funds. Okay. I, I'm just wondering... I'm just wondering if somehow, and I'll probably get shot for saying this from some people, if we if the city shouldn't take this over and the city shouldn't be applying for the grants, we missed the we missed the window this year. Um, it was mid May. Um, Utah Utah Arts people 
have museum operating money uh, for local governments. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't, we shouldn't do and, and apply to NEA and a couple other things uh, so that that museum is open more. They, they did apply and they generally receive from the arts, from the ZAP there? Do, 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 no, this yeah. isn't ZAP. This would be state arts, the Utah arts oh, people. State. I don't know if they do the state or not. I know they apply for several. They may, I don't know about the state. Okay. Uh, but I, I think that um, prior to distribution, just like the arts council, we need a, we need a contract with the 501c3 if we're gonna give them money they probably ought to count for how we do the money if we if this ever gets dispersed. Yeah, we, and we do have them re required to report to us before giving them funds, which is why they haven't received any. They have been open a few times, not very many. They were scheduled to open, oh, probably about a month ago. And the lady who was scheduled to go open ended up getting sick with COVID. It's a lot of older people. So they're more susceptible to it. They've gone through lots of difficult times. So we're looking to see how they're going to pull this off and re, reorganize themselves. So it's on their minds as well. I just looked it up and they haven't received any money since June 30th of 2019. Okay. I, I do think that probably since how they're a 5013C and the arts are a five, we probably should try to treat them similar, right? They should each have a contract. They should each have a reporting. And I think that's where we are. It's very similar for both. Okay. Anything else? Um, I just want to uh, point out line 16, that the elections budget has $10,000 in it so that we can automate our stupid finance campaign financial reports. So I think that's a great idea. Tangi should get uh, bonus points for that, for trying to get away from a spreadsheet and getting us with an online system. And for those of you on the council that don't know what kind of system it is, go out to Sandy City. Sandy City uses the software that it looks like we'll probably go with. Sandy City uses it. And by the way, if we use Sandy City's template, we, it costs us less money. Uh, change, our, change our name and we'll be, change the name and we'll be okay. But uh, if you want to see it in action, go out to Sandy City, click on their uh, financial reporting, and you'll see how that works. And it's it's really pretty slick, and it'll it'll save City Recorder's Office uh, uh, a lot of hours for that. So way to go to automate because that's not a very big cost at all. So does anyone? I just want to say on line thirteen, I'm going to say. Okay, but I want I want an ROI and I want to know what it is. Honest, honestly, I'm not okay with it. I don't I don't see in a tight budget year why we're asking for almost one percent property tax increase for lobbying for the federal government. Uh, there's 535 uh, people who can't get their job done back there. And I, I, unless there, if, if we're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars, there better be a substantial ROI, uh, because it just, it just doesn't seem appropriate to raise taxes to have. A so Ms. Barker, do you have something to share with us that will help us feel better? I've been waiting all night. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really just want to thank you for bringing some sunshine to this issue and addressing it in a public meeting, because I think it's really important for people to understand where lobbying dollars are spent more than almost anything else in the budget, because it's questioned by people. So I want to share two things. The first thing is I think this is a really budget lobbying amount. This is probably a, a a good lobbying budget similar to what our neighboring cities are spending is probably closer to 250 or $300,000. So this is at a budget that will allow us to get our toes wet and start competing for dollars. For the last two years, we've missed out on excessive amounts of federal funding that we're not even being considered for because we're not playing the game. I think it's really important for us to get involved. However, I want to be incredibly clear with you that I don't think you're going to see ROI as quickly as one year when you're talking about federal lobbying. These types of things take 
three, four, five years to come to fruition. So I want to be super upfront and honest with you about when I think you'll see it, start seeing our ROI. I hope we'll see it this next year. I think there's an opportunity for us to pick up funding potentially on 1300 West on the Big Bend project, as well as potentially some other transportation projects throughout the city. Um, but but I can't promise that $100,000 this first year is going to buy you uh, what you're looking for. So I, I want to be really open and clear about that. Can you send me data on what other our neighboring cities yes, have I got, absolutely can. what they've spent, what they've got. Yeah. S- South Jordan, um, their last expenditure, they're currently looking for a new federal lobbyist, but their last expenditure, their budgeted expenditure, I don't know what their actual is yet, although I've asked, was 250000 Um, Corbin might have more experience with Sandy, but I talked to Evelyn and there, she told me they are spending in excess of that amount. I don't know, Corbin, if you have kind of some historic historical data so that you could share. What do, what do they get for this? <laughs> Millions in, of I, dollars in road funding I, and infrastructure projects, water projects. Yeah, I can, I can tell you anecdotally in Sandy, I guess, uh, or historically, I don't know what they're doing. I have no idea now, what they're doing these days. Right. Um, you live there. <laughs> I should know as a resident, right? Um, over my, uh, I was in Sandy nearly 16 years. $100,000 for federal lobbying was what we were spending probably 12 years ago, 13 years ago um, at that time. It, uh, Tawny's right. If my experience with lobbying at the federal level was um, feast or famine, but if you didn't do it, you missed out on the feast when it was those years. So for example, we got $30 million for um 13th East, a total reconstruct of the entire road, the entire length of the city. We got uh, $10 that's million. Why you dollars. Got those pretty walls. Yeah, that's and right. How you got pretty them. walls and okay. landscape medians mm-hmm, and a rebuild of the road. It was federal. It was federal. That's a state, or excuse me, that's a city road, but the rebuild came with a federal appropriation. You there was some city was match. Red, but okay. There was some city oh. match to it, but. Um, it was a, a lot of federal dollars. There was a lot of federal dollars for water projects as well. And there were a lot of years where we didn't get anything, but the years that things came, uh, they were big dollar amounts. So I think you can measure a good ROI, but I think you need to look over a long window. And I'll turn the city is, takes forever. The state takes longer and the feds. Federal takes it longer. <laughs> or I could as the mayor just go out to Washington DC and spend a lot more time up there. And uh, No, thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to. Eat. <laughs> I think the the only other anecdotal information I would add is that you've seen the um, amount that you put into local lobbying pay off big time for you over the last two years. And I think we can deliver similar rewards. I just think that lead time is a little bit longer. It took us, you know, I've been here three years. It took us a good year to kind of spin that up. Um, but we saw a great return on investment last year, um, some return on investment this year when uh, there wasn't quite as much money going out. And I think we'll continue to see that locally. So I think you can see where the potential is on that, um, but want to be super honest about what you've got in front of you and what that means. Okay. Are there four of us that want to change that line item? No. Probably not. Okay. I don't like it, but all right. And I may vote against the budget just because of that line item. Why don't you, instead of voting against the budget, amend the vote to take that line out and vote on it separately? Just a thought. Um, but the the what o- else? The other number on page one seventy. Um, I'm not comfortable with thirty five thousand dollars in citywide surveys. You think it should be more? I think it should be less. I think it should be more. <laughs> Does anyone want to address think, what they are? The tool that we use, I think we could probably use it a lot more. But Corbin may want to add to this, but I, at most cities do a citywide survey. This is a pretty budget figure for us. Um, often they cost upwards of $50,000. We probably can't do it for cheaper. Um, this first year, we are, we're participating in the Utah state surveys to give us a little bit of a baseline, but it really doesn't give us the full information that we need. So um, that gives you some perspective, but this is just 
for us to find out what residents are interested in, find out more about the budget, find about where they want us to invest money, find about find out about how they want us to communicate with them. So that's it's really Oh, I know, Mayor. You can just knock doors and get that. I'll let he's, you do he's that. He's pretty good at that, but Corbin, I don't know. Do you have anything you want to add to that or um, 35,000 is for a, an independent third party market research company to do the survey for us and uh, make sure the data uh, and the survey questions are really. Um, so yeah, what are you hoping properly. to gain from this? Here's what I'm hoping to gain throughout this budget book. There are a lot of performance measures. There are some also major performance measures measures missing. For example, law enforcement, we can measure. Uh, response times. We can measure uh, officer uh, calls per officer or um, call, you know, officers per thousand. But the real measure that I care about is the perception of safety in our community. And is that perception of safety in our community getting better over time? Um, similarly with um, when we talk about aesthetics, we care a lot about aesthetics. We try hard to do things in the budget about aesthetics. We want to know, do our residents love living in West Jordan? And is their perception of West Jordan improving over time? Those are real performance measures that I think belong in the budget book. But it costs some money to measure those things. And the citizen survey is a way to do that. Thoughts? What he said. So you're okay with it? Okay. Pamela? I'm okay. Okay. I'm okay with that. Oh. All right, moving on. Can I move for a five minute recess or you're not gonna have a quorum for about five minutes? I will second that. And I guess we'll have a five minute recess. Is anyone else freezing? Yeah, it's first time here in well, if everyone's no, it's not sure. It only doesn't. So, you saved the day. <laughs> 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 That was my fear. Okay, as you are. I think you do. He made more 
It's cold in here. Yeah. I think Isaac was been fixing it, he said, but I still went out and got my jacket. It's like, yeah. I might have this one. And that's a really good price. And I buy it. Every time I see a good yoga fan at Costco, I have to get it. <laughs> okay. So this coat has sat in my car for a long time because I really and don't need it. Handy. But <laughs> tonight, I'm glad it's there. So, when, what, what we don't finish with tonight, what happens? Yeah, we're going back to TNT. So, we still have to do it. And we have our next work session, too. Okay. <laughs> We're going to reconvene. Denise, buy some budget software. All right. So we are moving on to debt service. Oh, you don't want to touch that one. Yeah, we do. Anything there? Debt service. Anything? No. no? Okay. Um, what about transfers out? Nope. Class C road funds. Development service funds. Scott, you really want yeah, your own it. fund? It's not for this year, but something to keep in mind. The backstory. Okay. Oh, I know the backstory. I was just asking if you really wanted okay, so it. So we have a class. See road fund. Um, and I don't. I think it. I don't think it goes on here. This is not for this year, but something to keep in mind. Um, octagons for busy intersections in the future. That allows for fire and police to go all red, so they're safely through that. That is one that they mentioned that they would like, but they know how tight the budget is right now. So that's something we should keep in mind for the future. And they cost. They're pretty pricey, about 40 50 k per intersection. Yeah. But they said it's a huge help. Yeah. So just to, just to put in the back of the mind for future stuff. That's all. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, development services. Highlands Craftsmade. Capital Projects Fund. I think we talked about. Yeah, we talked about the roundabout. I'm still concerned. The only way to not get it built is to take their money away. Do we want to take their money away? No. Okay. No. And then um, I know I want to work with the legislation and the staff to try to fast track 7,800 South. I know um, I want to talk to you guys. It, the police do have three years of studies to show UDOT that we can't wait until 2025 on 7,800 South. All right. How about hold on? There, there was <laughs> crimes coming. Just an update. Me and the mayor met with uh, the region two director. We're going to be doing hopefully some striping changes up there that will assist with some of the traffic flow there until we get it widened. Um, that's the quick fix right now, but it's going into design. It's it's going to take a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but we have been in contact with you, Dot. I'm um, talking about the widening. They're on the same page now. They misunderstood what we were wanting at first, but uh, Mayor Burton has set them straight on what the requirements are. So um, it is moving forward. It will take a while though to get that one done. So, more done. I'll have to have you walk me through what the striping changes are because I'm. We're working on those right now. So as soon as we get some plans on that, I'll. Bring it back to because people time. already don't follow the lines right there, so I don't know how much that's going to change. Because people are no, it's going to be some can. asphalt work too. I think that's going to be yeah. required there to widen some of that out right now. This is a temporary, temporary. So yeah. we're looking at some different options. I don't have it drawn up yet though. Um, so. <clears throat> yeah, 
the other thing is the timing of the light. But yeah, yeah I mean, that's not, it's not a budget discussion anymore. But the timing of the light on uh, at Mountain View. Okay. Yeah, we're on the same page. Zach, Anything yeah. else in capital projects then? Okay, C <laughs> CDBG. Oh. Anything? Is this where we wanted to? Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. Eve nice Crocker. to go, Siri. <laughs> Story of my life today. <laughs> No, we're good. I'll talk to you about it later. Okay. All right. How about the water fund? That was on. There's a. I I I still would be in favor of increasing landscape. Just so long. I have that on my notes as well. I'm. I would be interested in that. On the water fund. Yeah. I thought we were going to postpone and have the well, whole. We're going to bring you back a water study and we'll have a, a good, healthy work, work session on that. So we can okay. run some numbers. Um, sewer fund. Solid waste fund. Which we already discussed. Yeah. The fee waiver program to this, the second rental yeah. to the market price. Yeah. We've yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. By the way, I'd be uh, I'd be okay in increasing as we talk about the streetlight fund. I thought about this, had a little bit of discussion with Denise. Um, I think we're talking about raising it to a dollar seventy four. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to raising it so that um, our streetlights are a dollar ninety nine. Uh, you know, do the do the Kmart marketing process, raise it raise it to a dollar 99 but uh it gives us a little bit of money now and then we don't have to raise it for three or four years so i'd be okay with that if we wanted to look at that what page is that on street light and here we go page 248 and 249 So the proposal for the five-year plan for the street light fund is to raise it 2% a year, um, which would get it to 288 in five years. But um, Council Member Green would just like to leapfrog and put it where it will stay for quite a while. 188 in five years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm fine where it's at, but it's, okay. it's like 10, 20 cents. So I'm not. Some people are on fixed income. Council member Jake, yes, and I'm one of them. <laughs> what would you like? Nobody seems to care when they raise gas prices. No, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Either okay. Way. Okay. Uh, well, you're fine with what? But you get a dollar ninety nine or stay. Either way. I'm fine I'm with fine it. Too. Either way. Like you said, it's only twelve cents. <laughs> I am fine keeping it as as it's written in the budget. Okay. That's fine too. All right, IT management fund, risk management fund. I can't do anything there. Um, fee schedule. Did we make any inflationary adjustments on the fee schedule at all? A lot on the development services side, um, but not on some of the basic services side. I have a question for my fellow council members on 287. Um, these prices seem really low to me. So do we want to have like a committee to study them and decide if we're happy with these fees? Any interest in that or no? I would be interested in exploring that. Are you talking about business licensing fees in general? No, I'm yeah. talking about page two animal services, which says neuter and spay. To my 280, which page? It would be helpful to have a council committee that I looks at fees on, a, on an annual basis because some of these fees, and, and even has presentations from these departments, because some of these fees have a social impact, some of them have a community benefit, and you want to have them kept low enough that that benefit continues to encourage the use, 
but there's also others that you're subsidizing. So I think it would be really beneficial to have a committee of some sort that um, was able to have some input on this. Council Director Anderson, would you please write that down and let's work on it? Okay. okay. Yep. Putting together committee like for that. One of, the, one of the things that while we're looking at that page, I want to bring up. And I know this is this is weird, but I think it's absolutely nuts, particularly if we're going to an online software system. I think it's nuts that the chicken permit is managed by the business license people instead of, but it's listed under the services for animal services. And I think it it it, it just makes. Yeah, I don't get foul. Yeah, okay. And 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 I, I don't know how the writing stables work, and I don't know how the kennels work, but I'm sure those are permits. And so they're probably done by the business license people as opposed to the animal people. But who gets to enforce it? Code enforcement probably doesn't enforce the chickens. It's probably animal and animal services that enforces if there's a chicken issue, right? No, that's code Just, enforcement. I, animal I, control I, would do it if the animal's being mistreated, but if it's due to zoning, then it would be code enforcement. Councilman Green, I asked those same questions about six months ago. Uh, why in the world is our, uh, our fowl permits done by business licensing? And uh, my understanding was there was a very long and convoluted controversial process uh, with, the count with previous councils quite a while ago that led to that. But I don't think I, I don't have this history on that. Certainly, I don't know if Mr. Langford does either. But um, my understanding was it was a council <laughs> compromise and why it ended up where it ended up uh, at that time. But it does seem out of place. So could you rephrase your question? You're, you're asking <laughs> No, Without I'm just enforcement or I'm just thinking I'm just thinking exactly the same thing that Corbin's thinking is that this is out of place. Um, your business license people shouldn't. And, and, and here's part of the reason why I asked this. I had a chick. I had a chicken permit and I got rid of the chickens and I get the, the renewal in the mail that says you're up for, and it's the business license renewal permit, but then it says chicken license. And then you're calling the business license people to say, oh no, you, you don't need to do my, yeah, it makes it soup. <laughs> it, 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 it's like what, like what Corbin said, this is, this is out of whack. And maybe this is just something that is over the course of the next year. We need to look, but particularly if, if we're going to online dog licenses and those kind of things, can we use that software to license chickens and license the, the whatever else we license, the chickens and the, there's, there's another bird, the pigeons. The chickens and the pigeons, mm -hmm. can we use the same software to uh, deal with the, the kennels or the riding stables or I don't know. We just need to. We. I'm just thinking that we need to take a holistic look at this to make sure that it's in the right department and that the right people are. I can guess, Councilman Green, why it's in business licensing because that is more in the the land use, how you're using your your property, and that falls in line with business licensing and and the planners review that portion of the code. And, and so it's sort of gravitated. Now, if you if you move that out of business licensing, we'd be okay with Look that. Look at that smile. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it makes sense. But as you well. know where I, you know I where would, I'm no going with this is what we need. I think what we okay. need to do is look at the common sense. Budget but, though, so yeah, it's not a budget <laughs> issue. But I'm going to take that as a cue that it's okay to start asking some more questions and consider it. I thought it was a. Oh, I'm all set upon. I thought it was a sacred cow I shouldn't touch. <laughs> um, on page 289. Uh, I have one on 286. Oh, you have one on still. Okay, go ahead. Um, sorry, just get. No, go ahead. Talk fast. Um, I would, I would, here's a 
a random thought. I brought this up a few years ago, but I have a different approach to it now. What if we take animal license fees down to zero? Uh, maybe just for altered animals. I don't know. Either way, and increase fees. I, I don't know exactly where where it would be, but increase fees for the boarding or for the impound um, and owner release. So, so we've talked about a committee. Do you want to serve on the committee? Sure. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, we can do it over Zoom. <laughs> um, yeah. So if we're gonna if we're gonna committee look at this, this is what I'm thinking of. Why why charge people to have a cat or a dog? They cost enough anyway um just to have it charge them charge the ones that are using the system that are using the system that are you know the impounding the the rescuing the the whatever the things are that the system is actually does my dogs have never been a burden on the system at all why should i have to pay ten dollars a year to keep my dogs on the off chance that they become a, a drag on the system no, I, I charge them. Charge them when they become the drag on the system. Or I would even eliminate the ten dollars a year, but increase the unaltered. I that that would be a good compromise that I mm -hmm. can live with. But I, I'd rather get rid of all of them. So I so. think it's a good item to put to a committee and study. Okay. <laughs> okay, the next one is two eighty nine. I just wonder if our pawn shop business fee is high enough. And then I'd also, I personally think that we should add ADU. And my reasoning for adding an ADU line is that um, we are, we're asking them to get a permit anyway, because we'd like to know how many families are in that home for fire and police when they respond. And if it's there, then they, then it just makes it clear to people, yeah, you need to do that. Otherwise, how do you know? So. Thoughts on my thought. Isn't that already under rental dwelling units? Wouldn't they need one for a rental dwelling unit <sighs> fee anyway? I just think if you make it more explicit, it's understood better. Right. Uh, but there's probably some legislative issue that I haven't considered. Oh. Thank you for giving me so much time in the microphone tonight. Yes, I think you're going to see legislation on this this next year, and I don't think you're going to be able to increase fees. In fact, we may see legislation that says no. Fees. I didn't say anything about increase. I said no. just have a line item that no shows there is one. no fees. That's what they're pushing for is no fees, no well, impact fees, no historic fees. If someone has an ADU, we can't go back and back charge them. That's already the case, but I, I think we're going to see that push this next year. So just want to make you aware. So just make sure they're aware that public safety would like mm -hmm. to be able to know when there's an ADU in a home. And I don't know how we know that otherwise. But the, the so. statute, HB 82, allowed for a business license. Are they looking to try to push to eliminate that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they are. We um, had that put in last year. So we're going to continue to push for that. But the, the idea is that people could register it, but there would be no fee associated. So there was a requirement to register. There would be a potential that they could have to pay a penalty if they don't register, but that we may see that fee go away this legislative session. So I just want to make you aware before you spend too much time on it. Thank you. To clarify, Councilman Green, we do uh, require a rental license. So there, there is currently a way that we are recouping some of that and and, and mine and, isn't and, really and and mine isn't the finance mine is that we need a way to know am i going in on the scene sure. have i got a family upstairs and a separate family living quarters downstairs it, because when people call 911 they may not say oh by the way my family lives in the basement and seconds matter when someone's dying so, you know, let me know when I need to call those legislators. Love talking to my friends. Um, anyone, uh, my next tab was on page nine and it had to do with, um, well, I just don't know why we have city hall in here for this year anyway. I think it should be taken out because we're not running out city hall for the year. And this book is for this year, but unless the city hall's done by next April, the contractor says it's done three sixty five, and we'll be we're in that budget. We're going to start year. renting it out already. Okay, uh, Pioneer Hall. 
I'm okay to leave the rates where they're at for residents, but I think we should raise them substantially for non-residents. Page, Page nine. nine of the consolidated. Page Anybody? 293. 293 oh, of the yes. entire budget book. Yeah, thank you. Even smaller font. <laughs> Would the three of you be okay with raising those? With raising Pioneer Hall fees? For non-residents. I'd be good with that. Yeah, oh, I'm okay with that. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Denise, do you have Council, a suggestion? I, I have a question. I see four of you in favor of that. Again, uh, I'd ask that Isaac and Denise work together and then bring back to you a proposal knowing your direction. Okay. All right. Just for non-residents, though. Um, can can we go back to page eight? I, I realize that there's one. Yeah. I know that I know part of this was because I mentioned something to uh, to the staff uh, under the hearing request filing fee. If it's an appeal for a, a notice of violation, it's no charge. And then there is B, a fee for an appeal of anything other than a notice of violation. What appeals do we have that are not a notice of violation? Sorry, I, I was taking notes. So uh, what appeals do we have that are not? I get grandma appeals all the time that are not notices so of violation, this, but I don't know if that's what this, this is. Referring is this to. is specifically where, under code, you at? code enforcement hearing request filing fee. Is there, Scott, is there any time that code enforcement would have an appeal that's not a notice of violation? I'll have to talk with Brock, but I'm only aware of that one that one category. So it, it, under, under code enforcement. Yeah. Well, we, we, you just check it. If I will, if that just seems weird that, so we can, but that's a, that's an easy change because we can just delete the line if we need to. Hey, council, if, if I may, um, instead of using the fee schedule page number, if we can go with the budget book fee schedule, so the minutes are consistent, that would be helpful for us. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know what the budget I didn't put my in. I know, but I, my, I didn't put my I didn't put my update in, so I don't have the right page number for that page. All right. Is there anything else in the fee schedule for anyone? Uh, just on page three ten to update to what we're going to want to do with the dumpster rental prices to make that note in there. So on two B C D, we want to make sure that we're we're going to get that updated with the other pages. But so um, for Becky's input, B C and D will change to two hundred and fifty dollars per rental. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's right. We did talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then on the on one E, are we going to get rid of that since we're not going to be doing the green waste? That, that's november of 23 which would be the 24 okay. budget i just year. wanted to make sure of that okay anything else no um oh you want to correct anything in the glossary I, i'm actually wondering okay. i'm gonna i'm gonna say this i'm actually wondering if we shouldn't raise the elected official filing fee Hey, until I brought it up, we didn't charge anything. <laughs> I'd prefer that we didn't charge anything. I don't think we need to raise it. I okay. think we do want to encourage people to run, but I do think we need to recoup some of the money. Um, Fairway Estates. Municipal Building Authority. That was a big budget. It's huge. Redevelopment Agency. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I got it. Actually, what do I got? Oh, I know what yours is. Go ahead, Kelvin. <laughs> no, that, that one doesn't matter. Oh. Hold on. I don't have anything until down to RDA. Uh, oh, but that's a, I'll just bring it up, but we can deal with that when we get down to page 12 of the RDA. Uh, 
Is, is anybody else? What, 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 what does page 12 look like in your? I'm book? sorry, page 13. It's okay. 14. It's got page 12 and page 14 on, on it. Okay. Yeah. I've got it's that the too. map. Okay. What about um, it? I'm just wondering if. It's 1300 West, 7800 South. Yeah. It's the 1300 West, 7800 South. It's RDA number two. Um, I'm just wondering, and this, this is a, this is something reserved for later, but since we're going through the book, I've got it marked. I'm just wondering if we don't want to look at the boundaries of RDA number two and move the one little section between 13th West and 15th West, move it out to, uh, 7,800 South to cover a couple of really ugly looking properties there and a couple and look at a couple of properties across the street on 7800 so it's just a it, it's it's not a budget issue but it's something that maybe we should look at about changing the boundaries on rda number two so maybe we should schedule it for a line item in yeah. a workshop so alan just think about that yeah put a note down we can we can review that so we'll actually have some funds coming back into the rda uh potentially uh into rda number two but anyway we, we can discuss that uh there is a short timeline left on that agreement it's uh two years okay and then it'll be closing but if those funds come back into rda number two we'll we'll need a place to invest those so um i can prepare something okay. to bring back to the council great and just if I may, the so the council's aware is we're adding things to work session. Um, we're allocating like one hour, 15 minutes, and we're starting to fill that up. We've got a pretty full agenda that's coming up. So work sessions are going to get full very quickly here the next couple of months. Well, and some, of, some of these aren't critical. So, Well, and um, just so you know, too, we can make improvements um, with RDA funds that have a direct nexus to the RDA. So it doesn't need to extend into that area. But as long as it has some benefit to the area, then we can use those funds to um, improve that space as well. Okay. Kevin, anything else in that? No. You don't? You don't have page 15 and 21? It's the Kmart page. Oh, that page. <laughs> I want to schedule that for a closed meeting. Okay. All right. Um, I do want to talk about RDA number four, but I think that one would be more appropriate for an RDA closed session. And I, I won't go into detail, but we'll just make that as a note that we, we'll talk about uh, RDA four as a closed session. Sounds good. All right. I have one um, on page 3249. This is CDA1, um, and this is really for Scott and Chris Pangra. Um, if you look, there's Pagoda Grove Circle, and I'm pretty sure it was Scott that told me it's not developed because there's not in water, infa maybe it was Brian, infrastructure or sewer or something. Couldn't we use some of something to get that there, or could we work with the of the developer of this project? You know, that put in that Starbucks for his retail um, to get it there, so that those lots could be developed. My reason is, I hear about a lot of drug deals and problems in that area because it's this nice little secluded circle in a neighborhood. And so I think we should see how we can can do something there. So I guess more of a soapbox, but budgetary wise, I just wonder how we could make that work. Does anyone have anything else? Yeah, I got a couple of okay. questions. We have two minutes. EDA number three, how long is that gonna supposed to, the Oracle one, Oracle data center, how long is that supposed to run? If you look on page 37, it tells you the run time. Um, it, the expiration was tax year 2021, so it's expired. So it's expired. So next year we'll pull this out of the budget book? Um, as long as the funds are fully expended. Oh, okay. 
And then the, 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 que the other question is EDA number four, the Fairchild one. So it runs through 2030. Okay. Because I don't, oh, there it is, expiration 2030. Okay. Just Try and give you as much so information efficient. as we can. And I had a question on CRA one, but I or CRA two, and I have no idea CR? what it was for. So I will forget that one. All right. Anything else? Well, look at that. We did make it through all the tabs. I want to thank all the staff that came tonight to help us achieve that goal. And I would like one final motion. Move to adjourn. Okay. Sit. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Good job, guys.